Hello everyone and welcome again to Admire's Close Up. This is your main man speaking, Admire Manyange. And joining me today, guys, if you are talking about one of the living legends in Zimbabwe, I'm talking about the music industry. Yeah, you heard me. If your list does not include the men I have today, something is wrong with that list. <laughs> I'm not being biased, ladies and gentlemen, but this is the hardcore truth. This man has worked with a lot of musicians around the globe. I'm talking about Olive Mtukizi. I'm talking about Ja Fraser, Amira Brown. I'm talking about a lot of those big superstars you now know and follow today. We have the man himself, the producer. I've often heard him hashtag himself as God's favorite guitarist. <laughs> oh, I like that. I love that. Welcome to the show, Mr. Molo Kunu. <laughs> Hello, admire, and uh, greetings to everybody who is watching and listening. Awesome, awesome. I see you are, you are in your workspace, eh? Uh, I yeah, I'm in, I'm in the studio. Awesome, awesome. You see, just before I get too much into what I want to ask you, there's actually a picture I saw a couple of days ago, and you, you, had, um, you had some screenshots of one of the powerful companies that ever existed in our mankind and they all emanated from a garage and like <laughs> there was facebook there there was uh i think there was google i don't know there was apple. Just a bunch of apple and and i saw there was more i was like wow now that's inspiring <laughs> <laughs> yeah Interesting. tell me about it. how does it feel to to have to start such a i mean your name is known all over the world and it started in a garage. How does that feel? Um, it's nice because um, every success story has to have a to, to, to have a story where you can trace it. Uh, I, I don't like to hear success stories where somebody just comes from nowhere and then all of a sudden they're at the top, and it's not very inspiring. But if you find somebody with a story where they tell you how they met obstacles on level number one, how they conquered them, and on level number two, how they conquered up to where they are. I think it's more interesting and more inspiring than somebody who just drops from nowhere. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the trajectory is knowing that this person started from there and then they're now here. I think it's also even inspirational as well. Tell me, what are some of the few problems I want to call them few because I believe, you know, you've overcome them. But what are, what are the few problems that you faced when you were starting uh, in this music journey? Um, I started the, my music journey during the 80s. And uh, that time, music was seen as something, as a profession for vagabonds. Uh, people were sort of, I can use the term like useless. So no parent wanted his child to, to venture into the music industry. So my parents were very much against me getting into the music industry. So my first obstacle was lack of uh, parental support, lack of family support, and uh, also a lot of discouragement from my, especially from my father. My father really tried to discourage me a lot, but I will not blame him because... Uh, it was not coming from a place of hatred or anything. It was there had been a number of musicians before that really tarnished the, the name of music. Uh, there, there are a number of musicians back in the 60s, in the 70s, who were known to be true vagabonds and uh, who really tarnished the name of the music industry. So every parent was afraid that their children would go that route. So I can say my main obstacle, my first obstacle, was lack of parental support. So I had to fight on my own. I remember I used to go on foot from Kwazana to South Aton, from Kwazana to town. Every time we used to do our, um, our music trips to, 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 to look for record deals or for photo shoots, we would foot very long distances because um, we had no parental support. No one could uh, give us uh, money for transport, even for food. So that was my first obstacle. Mm. Mm, indeed. That is that is really disheartening. I mean, the world has yeah, changed, um, and 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 many people. I mean, I see even your son. I think that's how. This is why you're very supportive in your son's career. I see Taka is doing great, and he's uh, working with a lot of uh, musicians. I see him with uh, 
Uh, he's uh, working with Zimpre, he's among us other big artists he's working with. And I think that's great that you're supporting your son and you don't want him to go <laughs> through that too. Tell me something before I go to break on the first segment. You always mm. hashtag God's favorite guitarist. Where did that come from? Was that like a prophet told you <laughs> or you, you had a vision? <laughs> how, did you, how did you even know about that? <laughs> uh, for some funny reason, I just feel God loves me in a very special way. Because uh, wow. even if uh, even if I look at my life, uh, mm. I can say I can safely say ninety nine percent of all the people that I studied music with, they are all late. They all passed away. Mm. Uh, some due to, in fact, most of them due to AIDS and uh, AIDS related illnesses. And um, I also remember coming out of very um, funny accidents, mm -hmm. but coming out very safe without any scratch or any mark on, on my body. So somehow I just sat down and said to myself, you know what, of course I'm not rich yet. I don't have um, some of those asses that people claim to for them to, to call themselves blessed. But mm -hmm. just looking at my life, looking at where I came from, looking at all the... The the, the 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 troubles that uh, uh, God shielded me from, I think God loves me in a very special way. And um, since I'm a guitarist, I think I'm his favorite guitarist. <laughs> amazing, amazing! I love I love that it's emanating from a place of gratitude that you yeah. are looking at your life and what God has done and. That's how you're drawing that statement. Because, you know, another person without this explanation would actually assume that this is coming from a place of pride right. and say, mm -hmm. I'm the best or kind of thing. But I'm happy that you clarified. And wow, you're such a humble man, you know. Um, Thank you. That is, that, is, that is amazing. Speaking of humble, you know, I actually remember that among us, the names you've worked with, I'm glad that my name is, is there as well. I mean, in 2015, <laughs> I remember <laughs> I worked with yeah, you. And, I, uh, I mean, you were like my first professional producer with my team in uh, 2015. And I mean, since everybody who passed through your hands have managed to have big names, I also believe that uh, <laughs> one day <laughs> I'm also yeah, gonna... <laughs> yeah, yeah, going to be very huge. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Every mm -hmm. uh, God's favorite guitarist. Now, tell me something before we go. Last question. Um, many people who have come through your hands, like I said, uh, they have made it. What can you say is that one thing you have done to help them to grow in their musical career? Um, besides recording people, besides um, giving uh, advice that is linked to music, one thing that I do is uh, I speak a lot with my clients, uh, giving them tips on how to survive in the music industry. So I think um, the majority of them, they take note and uh, use what I tell them. And the um, end result, they succeed. Mm, interesting. I like that. We're going to get into that shortly. Don't go anywhere. Mr. Monum Kundi is still with us in the studio. And he's going to tell us all that stuff that he says. He always tells people that succeed in the musical industry. So don't, don't go anywhere. We'll be back shortly after this break. And we're back with Mr. Monum Kundu still in the studio. We're happy getting all the wisdom and nuggets that we should hear. Sir, before we went on a break, you were telling us mm. that these musicians that passed through your hands, they were successful because you give them more than just producing. You give them advices on how to go about it. But before we get into that, you have worked with Sir Oliver Mtuguzi, right? The late... And I just want to know, like, how did you guys meet in the first place? <laughs> and uh, what was the experience like? I really would have loved to work with, uh, with Mr. Oliver. Unfortunately, I never got an opportunity to even stage with him. I always saw him on screens and everything. Um, what happened is uh, they were working with a guitarist by the name of Pilani Dube, and uh, he had fallen sick. And the, the very big tour that they were about to embark on, 
they were supposed to go to the states go to europe and they didn't tour around africa so they were looking for a replacement uh someone who could play zimbabwean bira guitar who could play a bit of jazz who could play a bit of almost everything because all of them took this music had a lot of bira guitar but it also had a bit of jazz and it had it had a bit of mbakanga so they wanted somebody who was that versatile so everybody kept telling them to look for mono so one time i was teaching guitar at prince edward school and uh, we were we did a concert with prince edward school uh, where we featured all of them to good and uh, that that was my first time to meet him face to face so he saw me teaching the kids and uh, demonstrating to the kids how to play his music so i think at the back of his mind he just said that okay i'm going to look for this guy so uh, another friend of mine blessing parutsa uh with his husband to the dumaninga um he wanted debbie metcalf all of them to go this manager to help us uh, get a deal in south africa so he took a tape where i was playing live to debbie metcalf so that uh, maybe she could uh, organize us uh, something so when they were discussing um all of them took us were saying you know what uh if we don't find this guy playing on that tape i will look for the guitar teacher that i saw at prince edward mm-hmm. or if we don't find those two guys maybe we'll look for mono because uh, everybody is telling us to look for mono but the funny thing is uh, all those three people the guitar teacher from prince edward and the guy playing the guitar on blessing parisa state and monum kundu was one person <laughs> so debi metka finally wow. found out um, found my number and then uh-huh. she called me february 2003 and then she mm-hmm. invited me for a rehearsal session so the rehearsal session was also an audition and i didn't know Wow. So I just came so that time all of them to was preparing to record this album Sibo. Mm-hmm. So one element of a good guitarist in African music is you have to be able to create your own lines is mm-hmm. very fast mm-hmm. and you have to be able also to 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 reproduce what you are given. Somebody can give you a guitar line with his mouth and you are supposed to reproduce it as exactly as it is. So Oliver Mtukuz wanted me to create my own lines because Oliver Mtukuz every time he created his music I mm. think he could not create lead guitar lines so he expected the lead guitarist to create the lines on his own so um, the first practice session he started playing and then I just came in with my own lines on the spot because uh, remember I had been a session musician since I started music in the 80s I have always been a session musician and that's one thing i was very i was expected to do so i was very polished in that area of creating my own lines so all of them was very much impressed after that mm-hmm. he organized that we go record this album but what happened is um, we were concentrating on the new album theo and we never did uh, his old music and uh, that time i was not yet expected to play with him on stage mm-hmm. so one day uh pilani who i was supposed to work with or replace when he, when he was sick he fell sick and he couldn't come to play so all of them took the call me and said you have to come and play because uh, pilani cannot make it to tonight and i said uh, but have, we haven't worked on any of your old material and i know nothing of uh, the old music and he just said just come so i came and that show was uh, we performed that show in a very weird way was uh, before he played any song he would ask me do you know ziwe mm. and they say ziwe is it the one that go babira babira and he said yes and i would say okay <laughs> give me two two seconds <laughs> ah. so he would be speaking to the people and say yeah 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 oh, ah, you know, ah, 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 blah 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 ah. blah <laughs> taking to the fans and i would be working on my lines very fast and then i t- and then i'll tell him yeah i've got it and then he says start start and then i'll just go babira babira so the whole show <laughs> we played the whole show like that so i thank god that um i was well practiced and um, ah. i'm very quick to catch my lines and of, ah. also all of them because this music is very popular so most people you just know it from from the radio 
So mm. I just not played it on my own guitar, but I knew some of the lines. So that's how we played the first show, and that's how I joined the band. <laughs> I can relate, you know, though the the very the very the thing you just did right now. I mean, like <laughs> happened happened to me in South Africa once. It was a show with Tech Shua, and um, so jokingly I said, "Ah, you know, I can play the keys for you." You know, actually, it was the night before mm. the concert, and I thought, I mean, Minister Tech Shua is a big man; he can't just risk his show and just call me to play keys for him. Actually, he did, mm. <laughs> and he's like, "Come on stage," you know, <laughs> and he's asking me. <laughs> You know, could I get it on that? Was I'm like, ah, uh, yeah. He's like, yeah. Now start it. Do 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 do. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can relate with that. But it's interesting. Yeah, but I was so, scared. I have to say, uh, I was really scared because uh, all of uh, them took the fans. They knew all the lyrics. They knew yeah. all the lead guitar lines yeah, um, yeah. by head. They could sing all the lines. So like, if you like mess up. Can... Uh, <laughs> Like people can know that that guy just hit a wrong line. <laughs> yeah, but his fans knew all the lines and all the lyrics. Wow. So, but I'm happy that I pulled through, and he was very happy. And the funny thing is, uh, after that show, he felt confident that I was okay, and he never called for a rehearsal. So I just went on tour. I had to find my own time to work wow. on all the other songs. But he was just confident that. Uh, Maybe this lady was saying this guy can play anything. This guy is well, a I am so, I am there. <laughs> <laughs> so he never called for any reason. So we just uh, went on tour. Interesting. It, tell me something more about Oliver just before we finish talking about him. What else was so? Uh, I know his music was unique, but I think many of us sometimes are not able to define what is it really that made that guy's music stand outstandingly above all other musicians? That's a very good question. Uh, the number of things, uh, as you know, Oliver Mtukuz was very international. He was uh, well known around the world, all around the world, and uh, even in areas like Finland, where you will not see even a single black person. His music was too popular. He was popular everywhere. And uh, what most people don't know, and that's where most young musicians are losing it, uh, the international community respects two things um, when it comes to musicians. They respect originality and they respect authenticity. Originality is sounding like yourself, like you're not copying textual, you're not copying Minister Mayendero, you're sounding like admire. And then authenticity is sounding like where you come from. Like a Nigerian, you can tell this is a Nigerian by the way they sing. A Jamaican, you can tell this is a Jamaican when they do their dance or but with Zimbabweans, most, uh, especially the young generation that we have today, they are busy copying Nigerians, they are busy copying Jamaicans, busy copying Americans. You will never reach an international level that way. Because the international community, they respect originality and authenticity. And Oliver Mtukuz was very original and he was very authentic. His music was very Zimbabwean. It was uh, his own style. And his music was based on Mbira music. But he created his own style where the acoustic guitar was the most prominent. And uh, he added some elements from a few elements from South Africa, a bit of Makanga, a bit of Afro jazz. But the dominant thing on his music was the Mbira element. That's why the lead guitar, he wanted a um, guitarist who could play Mbira guitar. So that element of um, originality, authenticity, and then... He had one style of music. That's also another element that uh, youngsters are losing it. You find one album sounding like a wedding playlist. Song number one is a rock song. Song number two is a dance or song. Song number three is a you song, is a soft <laughs> rock song. There's no identity. Yeah, uh, identity. So, Oliver yeah. as soon as his songs played, you could tell this, this is Oliver Mtukudzi. So hmm. he was consistent with his sound. And he improved within his own sound. Because the one time I did a, what we call a corpus analysis, where you look at an artist's uh, body of work and you look at how he developed his music. Mm. If you listen to all of them, to this music from the 70s up to the late 80s, his music was very fast. There was no percussion. There was no female big vocals. Some of the drums were pro very programmed. 
and uh, he had no distinct melodies on his instruments. Mm -hmm. But if you listen from mid 90s, around 1994, 95, his mm -hmm. tempo slowed down. Mm -hmm. The bass guitar became very less busy. The lead guitar became very melodic. And usually a song had two guitar lines only. One line for the kushaura part, one line for, for the vocals part. And he included female vocals. He included percussion. He included um, a number of um, new elements. So I was speaking to Debbie, Metka of the manager, asking uh, mm -hmm. what caused that change. And she mm -hmm. said that uh, Steve Dyer came to live at Debbie Metcalf's house uh, mid-90s. And all of them started attending Steve Dyer's uh, rehearsals. house. That's okay. when he started uh, copying those elements mm -hmm. from Steve Dyer's music of uh, adding percussion, adding female big vocals, slowing down the tempo making his instruments very distinct and very melodic. So that's why Debbie Metcalf suggested that on his next album, uh, on his 1998 album, he, he be produced by Steve Dyer. And uh, when he was produced by Steve Dyer, they produced that album, Tuku Music, which went international and he became more international than before. So back to your question, mm -hmm. what made all of them to the international and the huge like that? is his authenticity, his originality, and his persistence. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, we have a different definition of international. I don't know who came up with this, but trust me, believe me, this is what especially the young people think. When they talk about international, I think the very simple word to summarize what they understand is copying. <laughs> because I, 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 I've, I've not had the word that I can actually describe, like you just pointed it out, you know, doing American stuff, you know, they want to rap, they want to, you know. And, and That's a very serious point. Because what people don't know is that uh, Zimbabwe's most international music, since the music industry started in 1930, has always been centered around Mbira music. If you look at all the artists that became international in Zimbabwe, we've got Bundu Boys, all of them took the Thomas Mapumo, Stella Chuese, Chuoniso, Maraire. Um, right now we've got Mokomba and uh, some other groups on Blaue like Iasa. All those musicians, they became international because their sound was very Zimbabwean. And the majority of those the artists that became international, it, uh, their music was centered around Mbira, even though they didn't play the Mbira, actually, the actual Mbira. Some of them, they just played the mirror on their guitars, like Bundu Boys and all of them. So what the international community accepts is something that's authentic, something that sounds like where you come from. Mm -hmm. So as Zimbabweans, I think we've got a problem where we glorify copying. Mm -hmm. If somebody sings like Ara Kelly, we say, ah, he's good. You might even think he's American. But that mm -hmm. element of sounding American is what going to stop him from becoming international boss. Ara Kelly is there already. It's like you are looking for a parking spot that is that is a car which is parked already. The space mm -hmm. is taken already. America is not looking for another Ara Kelly. They have him already. He's mm -hmm. there in American prison. They want something from where you come from. And you wow. can, never, so, you can think, never be better than Ara Kelly because, I mean, he's If you listen to does. most of our artists trying to sound American, some of them, they sing through the nose. They, 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 they don't even hear that they are sounding <laughs> funny. One. But uh, I've been exposed to, to 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 music around the world. I've traveled around the world. I've mingled yeah. a lot with the yeah. artists around the world. I can tell that this person is trying to sound American, and even they can tell that this guy is trying to copy us. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Something... Mr. <laughs> tell me something. We call <laughs> it we call it mother tongue interference. It's called mother tongue interference. <laughs> Your mother yeah, tongue you... interferes with the pronunciation. Yeah. Have you ever told somebody in a session you're a producer? How often do you tell people the truth that, hey, Baba, <laughs> you're trying to sound <laughs> funny? <laughs> Have you ever told somebody that your accent, <clears throat> you're not being authentic? Are you that brutal yeah. when you're. Yeah. yeah, what I do is um, I use what I call a criticism, criticism sandwich. Because uh, my policies are if I'm giving somebody criticism, I want to be as polite as possible. 
but his will is uh, being as frank as possible. So what you call a criticism sandwich is where you praise the person, you tell him the good side of what Zaharubu Gwana was. No one can be bad 100%. Then after you tell them what they are good at, you you go straight to the point where they have to correct, and then you end with something which is good as well. So you have a sandwich. So every time I always I always tell people uh, the truth, but I try my best to to do it in a nice way. But still, mm-hmm. I always have artists that uh, end up changing producers because uh, they don't want to be told the truth. And uh, talking <laughs> of um, talking of pronunciation, I remember I was working with this lady. So uh, Derek Mpofu and Nicola were doing the big vocals for this lady. So I told this lady, you know what? All the songs that you are singing in English, they are not sounding good. Mm-hmm. But all the songs that you are singing in Shona, they are sounding perfect. So why don't you change to, to the, why don't you stick to Shona? She was not happy, but uh, she slightly humbled herself and uh, brushed it off. And then when Derek Mpof mentioned it, she, she, she told me, you know what? I don't want to work with Derek Mpof anymore. That guy is rude. That guy, blah, blah, blah. She was complaining just because he had told her that uh, you need to stop singing in English. So she looked for another guy. And then Nicola was um, doing a big vocals. And then when Nicola mentioned it, um, she, she came to me and said, you know what? Don't call Nicola again. I do not work with Nicola. But, uh, <laughs> I think the, the church that she goes to is not... Is not uh, I don't like the, the church that she goes to, blah, blah, blah. And I asked her, is it about the church or about something else? And then finally she said, you know what? She said, um, I can't sing in English. And so <coughs> she ended up changing everybody. Hey. So when I told her the second time, would, uh, you know what? I think those guys were right. You fired them, but they were correct. Then she fired me. She looked for another producer. <laughs> so we always meet such people. <laughs> Speaking of people, you gave the, what you call it, criticism sandwich? <laughs> yeah, criticism sandwich. Yeah, criticism sandwich. I like that term. We're going to talk more about the people you gave that. I want to, I'm very much interested to know if you gave that to John Fraser or Mara Brown or any of these superstars and what was their reaction. But we'll get back to that after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We still with the man himself, God's favorite, favorite guitarist. I'm going to start calling myself God's favorite uh, presenter, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you know, before we went on a break, uh, Mr. Mono, you were telling us about the criticism sandwich. And I'm so keen now. I want to know, have you given that? to um, <clears throat> some of these big guys we now know, like Ja Praiser or Mara Brown. Have you given that to them? And have you, what was their reaction? Um, the first time I worked with Ja Praiser was 2009. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was still very new, struggling, and I was very much impressed with him. So I simply encouraged him to, to carry on with what he was doing, because he was doing a sound that was very Zimbabwean. And I simply told him that if you stick to this sound, you, you are going to be big. And uh, for sure, it became big. But um, uh, by the time Tuku passed away, that was 2021, in my mind, I was saying, you know what? I think one person who can really fill up that gap is uh, Ja Praiser. But um, I'm sorry to say that I was disappointed when he changed his sound to that uh, Nigerian sound. And um, mm-hmm. it's not like Ndugumunye or anything, but because I told him, mm-hmm. I remember he came to my studio with Munya Fiali one night. He wanted to do a song. He just told me, I know what, Blaza, there's this song that I want you to, to produce for me. And you, I think you are the perfect person to produce it. They came around midnight. Mm-hmm. So um, as we were starting to work on the song, I said, ah, you know, this song sounds Nigerian. And he said, that's what I want. And I said, no, you know what? I don't do this type of music. And uh, I don't think it's good for you as well, because uh, you are Zimbabwean, you're supposed to sound Zimbabwean. I think that will, uh, that will set you up for, 
for, for, for, for the international for, for international breakthrough. So we really argued with JP in my studio and um, he was adamant that he was on the right path and I was adamant and I'm still adamant that my, my statement is true that for him to reach uh, the international status that he wants to, he has to stick to his original Zimbabwean sound. And um, I don't know if you took the advice, but uh, that day we argued a lot and we just said, uh, let's agree to disagree. And uh, I said the same thing to, to Amara. Uh, the, produce, the, producer, the producer studio arguments, I know those. <laughs> yeah, so we did the song Kure Kure. I produced the song Kure Kure that she did with uh, Jia Preza. And that song was a hit and it got uh, a number of awards. And mm. when she won that award, I sent a text message and they said, you know what, Amara, uh, congratulations to us for, 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 for the awards on that song. But I think uh, you need to stick to a Zimbabwean sound. Yeah. But she said, I know what, um, there's some experiments that I'm doing. I don't re remember the exact words uh, that she replied. And we met again another day in a shop. And I told her the same thing. And I said, you know what? I think if you stick to like the type of music that your father used to do, which was very Zimbabwean and um, very authentic, I think uh, there's still a huge fan base for, for that music because no one is doing the, that music. But uh, she, she politely refused. So I think on those two fronts, I lost the battles. But... Um, We'll see as time goes on, could who was right, me or, <laughs> or Amara and JP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, it's interesting. I, 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 I see, I see the, the, like I said, when I said in the previous segment that the definition of international differs with one. And I think the most prevailing one is like, as I have put it out, copy because that's kind of mm. where we're going i i hear that with my brother he's also a musician and he's always advising me that no you have to put this sound this synth you know and this that i've heard it on this guy and it's kind of like that you know but anyway <clears throat> back to the people you 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 helped um tell me something when you worked with job Fraser and you did uh, you know the heat that you you worked with him on what 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 strategy did you use with him? Or maybe it, was it the one you did with Amara? What, what, what strategy did you do that made those songs go up like that? I know one of it is the Mbira, obviously. It was traditional. Yeah. Um, one good thing about JP is that guy is very humble. That yeah. guy is very... He's one of the best people you can work with in the studio. He's very, very humble, and uh, he doesn't interfere with the production. He doesn't interfere with the mixing. He's so humble. He's one person you can really work with uh, any problem. So just because of that environment, that working environment alone pushes you to do your best. So that song, it was composed uh, right on the spot. Because he came with Amara. There was no song. So... I remember he asked Amara first, do you have any first lines or any groove that we can start with? And Amara was not sure, so he just started playing his mirror. So the first thing that we did on that song was the mirror. So he started playing his mirror. And then I picked the tempo and the time signature, I programmed the drum. And then we started building everything from there. I was working with the bass player. He was my assistant producer. He's called Solomon Sunguro. So he's the one who picked the bass and played that bass line. So it was a very nice groove and everybody was happy with the, with the groove. <clears throat> After we laid down the main groove, they did their vocals. They created everything on the spot. After the vocals were done, I did my lead guitar and then they left. And then it was up to me to mix and to add all the other instruments. So... I think the thing that made that song a success was the humility that Japres and Amara have. Because those two people are very humble. They are very good to work with. I mean, they are very... You know, because what other musicians don't know is they think for you to be said to be somebody who knows what he wants, you have to be very rude, you have to be very arrogant. That mm. type of uh, mentality, it uh, kills your music. Because... Uh, 
if the producer is frustrated, he won't do his best. So one thing that I have to give to Japreza and Amara is that they've got very good attitude. So I think that helped a lot in shaping their music. Just maybe before I flip this whole discussion to another level, which is kind of a little less about the music and everything, but I just want to ask you, what would be, from your entire experience over the years, what would you say is the best way of composing a song, right? From songwriting to adding flesh to it. In a nutshell, how can you summarize the best way to create a song? I think the best way for anybody to create a song is for that person to be able to play at least one instrument. Whether you, even if you are just playing basic chords, but uh, the fact that you can play an instrument, your mind is shaped in bits and bars. And uh, what you create usually, it's, it doesn't need much correction. Because I've worked a lot with artists who cannot play any instrument. And we're always... Uh, fighting with uh, trying to fit the melodies in a chord progression and uh, some of the melodies they were overlapping the beats and the bars because it was created with somebody who doesn't have beats and bars in his mind so when you're singing alone it makes sense to you because uh, there's nothing regulating the beats and bars so i think the best thing first of all every composer needs to learn an instrument then number two when it comes to the process I prefer a process where you can play around a chord progression and then you create the melody. Mm -hmm. After creating the melody, and then you fit in words to the melody. I think that's um, a composing style that I've seen used by a lot of people, all of them the Bob Marley. Uh, I even have a demo tape where Bob Marley uh, was playing some of his songs that were not yet uh, complete ly 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 lyrically. And he was just humming. Na, na, mm. na, 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 na. There were no words. And later mm. on, he fitted in the words. So as for me, I think that's the best way to compose. But uh, each composer has got his own way to compose. But that's my favorite way of composing. Because I'm also a composer. Before I could play an instrument, the first thing that I could do was to compose. Hmm. Interesting. I like that. Now, I'm just going to flip this conversation just slightly from producing and making and all these things. We're going to continue. I think I'm going to have to invite you on another session. But I've heard you on another platform. I think it was a radio station where you're talking about musicians that have made a little bit of a name and they get a little bit of a good big check. And the next thing they run to is to buy a Range Rover. Could you share a little bit about what do you think now we're addressing maybe the Zim community uh, or maybe anybody who is a musician out there who has probably made a stride, you know, <laughs> and they've gotten a, some good checks here and there. What do you think is the first step for any musician to do when they are progressing financially? Yeah, first thing I have to say is that uh, the Zimbabwe music industry is uh, very different from... Uh, the South African music industry, the Nigerian or American music industry. Because in Zimbabwe, our population is very small. We only have 15 million. And for a music industry, that's very small. And we also have a very bad economy. And uh, countries like South Africa have got, South Africa has got 60 million people. Uh, Tanzania has got more than 60 million people. Nigeria has got 200 million people. And USA has got more than 300 million people. So those numbers, they matter a lot when it comes to the music industry. So, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, when an artist has got a hit song, it's not common for you to have a hit song and fail to realize any good money from, from that. So, my problem comes when somebody is uh, pressured by people. Because what happens is, Every time people see you on TV or on newspapers, they think that you are, you are rich. Automatically, they just think if you are always on TV, if you are always in the papers, you are rich. So artists are always pressured to try to live up to those expectations. Mm -hmm. And in the result, they try to, 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 to buy expensive stuff that they cannot afford so that they live up to those standards. End result they end up in serious financial problems. So uh, in English, they call it status signaling, where you buy 
certain items so that you signal to people that you have reached a certain status. Um, and that's a problem that's very prominent amongst black people, even in America. They say that all the expensive cars, the Mercedes Benzes, and all the expensive clothes are mainly bought by black people who cannot afford them. And we have the same problem here in Zimbabwe. So I think we need to address those issues and teach people to invest. And investing doesn't mean saving thousands of dollars. You can start by saving that $5, that $20, that $30. And when you, when, when you are faced with problems, you can, you can sail through. Because I remember when we were fired at all of them to this band, 2007, uh, we were seven of us. And uh, I remember um, a number of my fellow bandmates, I won't name them, they fell into serious financial difficulties because they were not saving money. On. So in my case, I was saving money. So the only difference that was there was that I was not flying a lot like we used to do with all of them because it's been. But financially, I was stable. It doesn't mean that I had millions, but I had a few dollars that could sustain me in my studio was functioning. And um, my mother was sick. I was able to, 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 to provide uh, med 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 medical care for my mother. And um, everything was okay until my studio started um, functioning. So that's why I always tell musicians, say, don't try to live up to people's expectations. Don't be pressured. Because as black people, we've got too many pressures on. So we need to, 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 to educate our musicians to, to stay focused and save for a rainy day. Interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate, uh, you know, this is some wise uh, uh, talk. You know, um, I know of, uh, Mr. Arthur Marara is always stressing about stuff like this. But he He's one kid. of my favorite speakers. <laughs> he said this statement, he says, no fira Mahara. <laughs> yeah. Know. He speaks uh, a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. No, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> really appreciate the wise talk. And um, before you go, before we wrap up this, we I have this uh, truth game I play just before the, the show ends. And um, I just uh, have four questions that are lined up on the screen. And um, I won't tell you what they are. You just have to pick uh, two numbers of the four. And then I'll just read up the question right here. And then uh, you give us your honest answer. The interesting part <laughs> is you don't have to see the question. You just have to pick a number. And then I'll read out <laughs> the question. So you can select now. Okay, number two. Ooh, number two. Interesting. <clears throat> All right, number two reads, can you sing at least one bar in reggae about your wife? <laughs> <laughs> That's in reggae? Yeah, yeah. Just okay. it. Nice. Yes, the guitar is coming. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. <clears throat> um, hey, I don't have a song. Okay, I'll just create one on the spot. That's the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> Nina Kuda, Moody, Nina Kuda, Moody, I like that. I like that. I like that. Wow. See, we are talking to yeah. an actual producer. I see he just made a song. That's true for you. <laughs> yeah, on the spot. Ah, right on the spot. So give us the second number. Uh, let's play number three. Number three. Okay. Mm. So if you were not a musician, what would you have done with your life? Hey, that's a tough one. Maybe I would have been a teacher, a school okay. teacher, ah. because I love teaching. Ah, interesting. Mm. But a special one before you go, Mr. Mono, because you are your producer and I, I still have goosebumps and I see you holding a, a, a guitar there and I'm thinking, what can I do? Um, I think let's do something. Um, mm. this, is off, this is off script. I can give you a line and then you give it back. I was so fascinated when you said you were given lines on stage. So I'll give you a line with my mouth, then you give it mm. back uh, uh, with, with the guitar. Okay, let's try. let's try it. Let's try it. Um, all right. Dun, 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 d
That a lot of people have heard some way. Um, mm. You know that song? I won't tell you what song it is. I want you to figure it out. I want another one. I want another one. Mm. <laughs> okay. That one, you did it in D, uh -huh. but it's, it's in A. Oh, so I'll do oh. it in the A, in, in the correct key. Right. so much uh mr monum kundi it was such an honor having you on my show thank you so much for joining us thank you very much i uh, really enjoyed everything awesome awesome uh ladies and gentlemen you heard the man himself mr mono mukundu the producer god's favorite guitarist he was right here in the studio uh do share the video and if you are around zimbabwe and you're trying to record some music or you're looking for a mentor or you're looking for a coach he is the right man to contact hit him on his social medias that are reflecting right now on your screens as i speak Thank you so much for joining us. Do share the show and comment and share to your brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining us today. It's been an awesome time with, with you guys. Till we meet next time. full-service advertising agency with intentional creators who deliver innovative solutions, remarkable brands, and highly thoughtful experiences. AD Media provides a full-service brand and experience packages from start to finish. Whether your start is a blank canvas or a heritage in need of modernization, we also offer single service if you're not into that. From inspiration to execution, we develop the best ideas into projects and campaigns that allow small businesses and big corporations to effectively market their products, services, and events. To ensure successful advertising, we use quite a number of techniques, which include market research, conceptualizing, analysis, and evaluation. We execute every project and campaign with the eight-step process that delivers effective and strategic ideas in a short time frame. Whether you want to market a product, a service, a company, an event, or even you yourself, we will begin the marketing process by first establishing your target market audience and your goals. Whether you want to increase sales, improve customer experiences, or become the leader in your industry. So where are you going? Tell us, and we will show you how you can get there. For more information, contact the numbers appearing on your screen for a free consultation, and we'll take it from there.